Hi, this is Miles Maria, the Soldier of Mary. In this series of insights, um, things that we are revealed about the lives of Jesus and Mary from the saints and mystics and fathers of the church, I'm pleased to get to Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. She's probably my favorite of the mystics. Um, I've been trying to work out why that is, but I really like her. I really like her. I like her biography. I like her writing style. And, um, you know, she, she's also the closest to our day also, really, because Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich uh, died in 1824. She lived at the end of the 18th to the beginning of the 19th century. She was hidden from this world. Um, it, she wanted to become a nun. She kind of became a, a nun. She did become a nun. But then the convent got closed down and she had to move into the back of a tavern, into a room where she experiences stigmata, the wounds of our Lord, and sh oh my goodness, what an incredible and holy woman. She was able to recognize the location of the holy house in Ephesus, uh, something that was only tracked down after her death, using her descriptions. She was able to recognize holy objects. I mean, she was an extraordinary woman. From her earliest days, she had uh, apparitions and visions, and she could see angels, and she was... Um, she was incredible and she's written a little autobiography or maybe it was uh, Brentano her um, uh, secretary maybe he wrote it but again that's really worth reading it's, it's really wonderful again in the public domain like all of her writings are in the public domain and you can also uh, buy a version of them of course but you can download them off internet archive and and just read them and uh, like in all of these videos, I'm going to be looking at some of her insights in the life of Jesus and Mary. That's because I actually made a little book of um, rosary meditations where I take uh, segments of her writings and apply them to each bead of the rosary. In fact, this is by far my most popular book. Um, I don't know how many copies I've sold, but there's maybe 120 reviews of it on Amazon. So it's, it's really the only one that actually people buy, you know, like of the five books, maybe this one, um, you're di I'm talking about um, maybe 70% of the books bought. Uh, it's this one. This one makes up 70% of the books. Probably it's because, because of her, her writing style. I was thinking about this. How does she differ from some of the others? And one thing that, that one thing is she's kind of like a fly on the wall in her visions she's a fly on the wall she doesn't really she doesn't interact with our lady and she doesn't really talk that much to jesus and mary um but she tells us what's happening like a fly on the wall maybe that's why she is the one that people kind of like the most because it's very much like modern television where you don't tend to have every few seconds the protagonist looking at the camera and telling you why they are doing the thing that they're doing at that point in time instead you're just shown what's happening from a camera a flower on the wall and um and you kind of contemplate it so i think maybe that's one of the reasons why she appeals to us so much but also the details she's so rich in details but not superfluous detail that's the thing about um who I haven't covered in this series, um, the one uh, poem and the poem of the man god Val Valtorta is it Valtorta um, Maria? I tried reading through her poem of the man god, but for me that's full of what I'd call superfluous detail, things we don't need to know about that don't help us to meditate upon the lives of Jesus and Mary and become saints. It's full of details about villagers and uh, trees and um how a room is laid out and you know maybe it makes for great literature but it doesn't make for great meditative material because you've really got to go through lots and lots of pages before you get to something that you can meditate on to do with our lord and his his holy mother so let's um let me give you some of her insights since that's the nature of this what's meant to be the nature of this series I'll start with the insight. Again, I'm always 
going with the Annunciation, aren't I, in all these videos, probably because that's the start of the Rosary, and so it's the first thing I focus in on. And unfortunately, it seems like most of the videos, I don't get much further than the, the Annunciation. Um, but they've got insights, these figures that I'm, that I'm talking about. And even from, the, even, even from just one mystery like the Annunciation, there's loads more in there. For all eternity, we're going to be contemplating this stuff. Okay. And something that we don't get in any of the others. While I was seeing all this, that is like the Annunciation and everything, the Incarnation, in Mary's chamber, I had a strange personal sensation. I was in a state of constant fear, as if I was being pursued, and I suddenly saw a hideous serpent crawling through the house and up the steps to the door by which I was standing. The horrible creature had made its way as far as the third step when the light poured down on the Blessed Virgin. The serpent was three or four feet long had a broad flat head and under its breast were two short skinny paws clawed like bat's wings on which it pushed itself forward it was spotted of all kinds of hideous colors and reminded me of the serpent in the garden of eden only fearfully deformed when the angel disappeared from the blessed virgin room he trod on the monster's head as it lay before the door and it screamed in so ghastly a way that i shuddered then I saw three spirits appear who drove the monster out in front of the house with blows and kicks. So that's something we don't hear in any other mystic or any of the ones that I've been looking at. And it's not in the fathers. It's, it's something that Blessed Anne was able to see and share with us. I love this one as well. You know, amazing. It was at midnight that I saw this mystery happen. After a little while, Anne, with the other women, came into Mary's room. They had been wakened by a strange commotion in nature, a cloud of light that appeared above the house. When they saw the Blessed Virgin kneeling under the lamp in an ecstasy of prayer, they respectfully withdrew. There's something sober about Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich that you don't get so much in Mary of Agreda. In Mary of Agreda, um, at that point, you know, I, I don't want to be flippant about the whole thing. But at that point, the Venerable Mayor of Agrita would probably talk about uh, billions of angels surrounding Our Lady and St. Anne maybe seeing them and the women and themselves being transported into an ecstasy and going through to the third heaven. Um, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich is really quite sober in some of the supernatural aspects of of the lives of, of Jesus and Mary. So, and it's very human as well. Uh, I'm gonna sh shoot through some now, um, very human. So you've got Elizabeth who has this feeling that Mary is coming to visit her. She doesn't know why, but it's kind of an instinct. And so she's kind of in her confinement, she's pregnant, she's going out towards the edge of the compound and to the edge of the village because she's hoping to see Mary and Zachariah is, you know, signing to her and saying, what's going on? There's no way Mary's coming to visit you. But, you know, then of course she, she does. Um, and then let's, uh, let's, and sometimes, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, she tells us what happens. Um, she describes, without giving us all of the dialogue, um, and she describes emotions. So, for example, um, when they're told that they have to go to Bethlehem. Thereupon they returned to Anne's house, and I saw them preparing to leave immediately. Anne was distressed. The Blessed Virgin must have known that she was to bear her child in Bethlehem, but had been silent out of humility. She knew it from the writings of the prophets about the birth of the Messiah, all of which she treasured in her little cupboard at Nazareth. Um, you know, there's, yeah, today I saw the Blessed Virgin and her mother Anne in the house of Nazareth, where Josie revealed to them what he'd been told to him the previous night. Um, you know, there's like, um, she can be abrupt and tell us, you know, and then they did this immediately, or um, Anna was Anne was distressed, and it allows us to kind of then ourselves um, zoom in on what that emotion must have been like. Um, 
what about this one simeon um dies the day that he holds our lord and says the nunc dimittis that's beautiful that's you know and the way she describes it is so wonderful um it's in fact she says simeon from the couch where he where he lay spoke earnestly to his wife and children telling them of the salvation that was to come to israel and of everything that the angel had announced to him his joy was touching to behold he passes away um she gives us an account of the finding of the boy jesus in the temple in her one our lord kind of goes to different schools that are in jerusalem like for trainee trainee levites and he kind of goes along to different lectures and then on the final day that's where he has this debate and discussion with the with the doctors in the temple um let's see what else we have um we have um in the garden of gethsemane we have the fa made famous from the passion of the christ film satan as this uh as this kind of um um opposer adversary lawyer um in the garden hovering around saying to our lord will you take all this upon yourself are you ready to endure its penalty how can you satisfy for this you know he's you you get you get this in in Anne Catherine Emmerich it's very graphic and uh frightening in parts um what about this I'll give you something quite beautiful in the garden that is only kind of hinted at in Mel Gibson's film it's hinted at and you'll, you'll hear why if, you, if you've seen the film a few times while the adorable humanity of Christ was thus agonizing and writhing under this excess of suffering I saw among the angels a feeling of compassion for him there seemed to be a pause in which they appeared desirous of giving him consolation and i saw them praying to that effect before the throne of god from that point in the heavens in which the sun appears between 10 and 11 in the morning a narrow path of light streamed towards jesus and on it i saw a file of angels coming down to him they imparted to him fresh strength and vigor the rest of the grotto was filled with the frightful and horrible visions of sin and with the evil spirits mocking and tempting jesus took all upon himself in the midst of this confusion of abomination his heart the only one that loved god and man perfectly shrank in terror and anguish from the horror the burden of all those sins ah i saw so many things a whole year would not suffice to relate them and if you've read um the dolorous passion which is a lengthy book and a beautiful book i read that one lent amazing if you've read that then you'll see that our lord in the garden sees the sins of popes he sees sins of cardinals bishops priests he sins he sees sins against the blessed sacrament he sin he sees all of the terrible things that have happened in the history of the church um and he and he weeps and sweats blood as he uh takes upon himself uh, those sins of of the church and things that satan accuses him kind of saying look it's not worth it look how bad the church is going to be and so um there's some really wonderful insights into the passion which which um which you will all be aware of um so let's um let's give you something about um yeah a few bullet point ones so we have um the angels watching over our lord's body as it's waiting to rise again she describes it like like the ark of the covenant with the two angels either side bending over then we hear about um um before the ascension our lord leads a kind of procession with all the apostles and disciples and it's unnoticed or by a supernatural means the rest of the people in jerusalem don't really pay much attention to it but they all process and they kind of walk a bit of the route of the passion before our lord then goes up to the high mountain and ascends into heaven um what else what other insights can i quickly share um yeah so our lady um our lady receiving word from our lord that um that the apostles are to be present at her death and then 
as her death approaches, um, angels, um, oh yeah, the Blessed Virgin prays for the Apostles then to arrive as her death approaches and um, the call went forth to them in many different parts of the world and they were summoned by visions to come to the Blessed Virgin and the indescribably long journeys were made uh, made by the apostles were uh, were not accomplished without miraculous assistance often they traveled in a supernatural manner without knowing it and they sometimes passed through whole crowds without people noticing them um, then there's other kind of more smaller little insights so she talks about john the baptist um, physically preparing the way for the lord kind of it says here you know making pathways, laying planks across brooks, um, preparing places where our Lord is going to rest, teach and um, act, uh, which is interesting. And St. John is basically a bit like a visionary, according to Anne Catherine Emmerich. He's like in a prophetic state all the time. He's really powerful. Um, he's really, really a powerful figure in... Um, he was... Um, yeah, someone that Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich really picks out about how St. John the Baptist is is extraordinary figure and an extremely holy figure. Um, at the wedding feast of Cana, we have this thing that's also in Maximus the Confessor that, um, that the bride and the groom at the wedding feast um, decide to embrace uh, celibacy. So the bride joins Our Lady as one of her handmaids and the groom uh, joins Our Lord as one of the apostles. They've all been touched with a, um, they've been touched by Our Lord's example and they decide, um, uh, they decide on this, they decide on this. Um, next one, uh, what else can I tell you about some of these insights? Um, um, what, let's think at the transfiguration along with elijah uh, moses there is malachi mystically present at the uh, apparitions which is interesting the prophet malachi um what else can i tell you um at the last supper of course our lady receiving the the blessed sacrament um what about this really touching um element in our lord's um public ministry until far into the night i saw jesus with the old essenian Eliot of nazareth the holy man looked as if he would soon die of old age he was no longer able he was no longer able for much indeed he was almost bedridden jesus leaned on his arm at the bedside and talked with him Eliot was entirely absorbed in god it's brief but the scene is is really rich, isn't it, for you to, to meditate and contemplate upon. Um, let me, uh, yeah, so she, at the, at the institution of the Holy Eucharist, our Lord is quite clear in his explanations to the apostles about how they are to offer Mass uh, in the future. And he uh, instructs them on this. This is what Anne Catherine Emmerich is also clear on, that our Lord doesn't leave... He doesn't leave us. He doesn't leave the apostles uninstructed. Um, they know about the sacraments. They know about how to offer mass. They know um, exactly how to do all the sacraments, anointing of the sick or an extreme unction. Um, they know all about them, and he teaches them how to do these things. Um, and so, there's so much in Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. Um, she's amazing, and you can. I do encourage you to read her writings. And if you want to use her writings to meditate on the Holy Rosary, uh, you can get that book that I've um, compiled, uh, which I'm sure will help you. May Almighty God bless you. May Our Lady intercede you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit.